Hey everybody, tonight we're debating atheism versus pantheism, and we are starting right now with Jennifer's opening statement, defending pantheism. Thanks for being with us, Jennifer. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much for having me this evening, James. Great to be back again. Nice to meet you, T-Jump. Looking forward to this debate where I will be defending pantheism. That's right. In my belief system, we assert that the universe is God. Now, that may seem strange at first and maybe a tautological equivalence, but metaphysics and cosmology is sort of requires us to really situate a fixed point about which to make all of our other judgments. And I'm going to attempt to convince you during this debate that identifying the universe as God is the optimal way of prioritizing your thought process. It's very important because it frames all the rest of the questions that we ask whether questions have answers sometimes depends, a lot of the times actually depends on how we frame them. And if we'd like all of our questions to have answers, we have to frame them correctly. We have so much technological development in the modern day, but we're sort of lacking in spiritual awareness and suffer from what I would describe as a fair bit of existentialist angst. Man individually has some wiggle room as regards to uh, the beliefs that he espouses, but I'd like to invite you to consider the possibility that on the civilizational level, we really do need God. Going back for a bit of a historical review, as I mentioned the last time I was on this show, Giordano Bruno, as recently as the year 1600, was actually burned at the stake for espousing pantheist-style beliefs. On his heels in the year 1655, things had cooled down just a smidge when Baruch Spinoza was only excommunicated from his community for espousing the same type of divine equivalence with the universe. Going a little bit further, we see that this idea sort of took root with a lot of philosophers of the day, and they developed it into different dualistic and non-dualistic interpretations and debates therein. And finally, we have Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the inventor of calculus, who also espoused a pantheistic approach to his understanding of mathematics as well as the universe. And so that's uh, so definitely some evidence in the pile that believing this way does have good results, or at the very least, triggers some people in a way that justifies us inquiring further as to why. We have this idea of the monad that the atheist can't really contend with because it's easy to just equate reality with truth and say that truth exists because reality does, as my co-debater has stated in the past. But what does that really mean? What is this one essence from which the rest of the universe emanates. We could claim all we want to have an understanding of universal logic, but it needs to be demonstrated in a tangible way in order to be a valid form of proof. Pantheism gives us the framework, the metaphysics, the axiomatic architecture to go further into the ideal forms and drive more valid and demonstrated predictions therefrom. I'm very familiar with the argument that are, the argument is espoused commonly by atheists, namely that religion has been responsible for much human cruelty, as well as a subversion of the path of acquisition of greater knowledge. And while I acknowledge these points, I think it is an error to throw the baby out with the bathwater. As I stated earlier, man really does seem to, at least on the civilizational level, need this concept of God both to unify his own thoughts as well as unify the overall vision of the civilization so that it can progress forward in a cogent manner without sort of tripping over itself as it moves into the future. We are fundamentally, as human beings, contrast detectors. That means we tell the difference between light and dark, hot and cold, and so on and so forth. Now, if we want to really maximize the bandwidth of that contrast detection, 
We want to give ourselves a supreme ideal from which to calibrate the rest of our ideas. And identifying the universe as God, which is the largest conceivable thing, is making that calibration optimized. How can Jen know this, you might ask? Well, I could show you my awesome 3D periodic table right now, which I think feel very strongly indeed that it is more beautiful than any periodic table you have ever seen before. And indeed, the correct rendition of it is in three dimensions. No one else figured that out but me. And it is indeed because I understand the universe this way. The results of my beliefs and my beliefs themselves are inseparable. Without idealism, we are essentially animals. It's better to accept our theocratic nature and strive to optimize it rather than denying God altogether. I agree that truth is a property of reality, as you've said in the past, but if this is true, how come we don't agree on everything? And why are we having this debate? How come reincarnation isn't as self-evident to you as it is to me? You say cogito ergo sum, but don't computers think? Does that mean that computers share our sense of being in any way, shape, or form if they do indeed think? And if they don't, well, how do you distinguish it? These questions are important. And having a path towards the correct validated answers is important for people developing their sense of personal identity, which we are all driven to do, and should seek to do that in the best way possible. Ideals enrich identity. Strong identity is required for civilizational stability because, again, it's calibrating everybody's vision towards the same end. Rather than attacking the religion of people who often don't know any better, why not lead with a better example and simply embrace pantheism, which is not at all at odds with science? Thank you so much for listening to my introduction, and I'll cede my time to my opponent. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and we will kick it over to Tom Jump. And just want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And so we have many juicy debates coming up. In fact, folks, want to let you know, we are absolutely thrilled in case you had not heard. So we are absolutely still hosting this debate that you see at the bottom right of your screen. It's just postponed to sometime this month, something that I want to not rush, but we are definitely planning on hosting it this month. So, hey, folks, you don't want to miss that one. Hit that subscribe button so that you get a notification for it and so that you don't miss out on that epic debate. With that, Tom, the floor is all yours. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, James, for hosting. Uh, thanks for the, the debate. Thanks for showing up. Church of Entropy. It's an interesting name. I do like that quite a bit. Um, but I don't really understand what the topic is. So from your intro, I still have no idea what exactly it is we're debating. The word God, to me, refers to a supernatural, non-physical mind of some kind, some, some kind of non-physical mind. Um, the universe does not have a mind, as far as I know. Science says it doesn't. Uh, and so it would not fit the definition of a god so i don't think that would work now if you just want to say matter itself or matter and energy is divine like i don't know what you mean by divine but i'm fine with that i don't really care one way or the other but i just but i don't think saying the universe is a god would work because it miss it doesn't have that consciousness aspect to it but other than that i don't really understand what your argument is like you're just saying that People benefit from religion, and so if we treat the universe as the divine being, then we can benefit from religion too, because that that's, seems to be what your claim is, and I'm fine with that, but I, I don't see any reason. It doesn't seem to be any factual difference between what you're saying and just naturalism, and you're just calling naturalism a religion, which is okay, like, but I don't, I don't really understand what your position here is, so I'm just going to give the rest of my time to try and ask you, like, what, what exactly are you arguing for here? I'm just saying that people, by and large, need to believe in God. I'm saying that atheism isn't really a tenable position, because you're asserting a negative. Uh, I don't understand what you mean by a tenable position. Like I'm, I'm an atheist. Most philosophers are atheists. That's, that's pretty tenable. I don't. You mean like it's not as pragmatic? It's harder to live, harder to find meaning, or whatever. Well, you're basically denying the validity of God 
as an ad hoc assumption you can't possibly validate. Like you earlier said, the universe isn't conscious. How do you know that? Uh, induction. I'm using the evidence we have right now. Consciousness is only present in minds. And so we can conclude that the universe, which doesn't have a mind, isn't conscious. Isn't the periodic table proof the universe has a mind? No. How would the periodic table be proof the universe has a mind? Is this doing inherent computations that are always equal? Computations don't require a mind. Calculators can do computations. The universe can be demonstrated to be conscious if you define consciousness as the ability to make observations. Because according uh, to quantum mechanics, observation and waveform reduction are identical, and everything that a waveform does in some sense is waveform reduction. Well, if you're defining consciousness that way, every electrical diode is conscious because in quantum physics, an observer is any sensor that causes the collapse of a quantum function. It doesn't actually have a mind at all. It's just anything that can cause the collapse, which are physical objects like sensors. So by that definition, sensors are objective or are conscious. But if the conscious. intrinsic action is observation, doesn't that imply that it's a mind that's doing it? No, because observation doesn't mean mind in physics. Observation just means collapse of the <clears throat> wave function. Exactly. And it requires interaction. So the thing that the universe is conscious of is the fact that it exists in a three plus one dimensional causality. No. So there's definitely a way to defend a conscious cosmology, uh, cosmology. Not that I necessarily take that position because it doesn't really make biological predictions, which is usually what people are interested in. They're interested in subjective consciousness more so than objective consciousness, but you can nevertheless prove that the universe is at least proto-conscious, as Dr. Stuart Hameroff has said? No, you definitely can't. Uh, Hameroff's position is hypothetical and it's rejected by the majority of philosophers. So you definitely can't prove it's proto-conscious. Uh, it's, it's essentially just a hypothesis that there are proto-consciousness particles and his idea of consciousness being fundamental to the universe has no basis in reality. It's rejected. Idealism and panpsychism are like single digit percentages in philosophy and even less in science. Well, that's positions. an ad populum fallacy. And when in all of human history oh. have the majority of people been right about anything? So it's not an ad populum fallacy uh, because an ad populum fallacy is when the majority of random non-experts in the field have a position. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on fallacies number 10. Uh, actual authorities are reasonable to reference when we're talking about a, a field of expertise. So it's not an ad populum fallacy. But again, well, can that I still, field demonstrate seeing, an I'm understanding of the subject it purports to understand? Like what's, what? what is consciousness? Consciousness is phenomenological consciousness is the qualia experience we have when we like see experience stuff. Yeah. So you're using Hameroff's def definition there. Qualia mm. is something Hameroff came up with. So it's like, there are no qualia because there's no instances of non-consciousness for, because for there to be an instance of consciousness means it has to have a boundary and there is no boundary to consciousness. So the, the very framing is self-refuting. No. So again, qualia, qualia, the word being invented, which I'm, pretty sure he didn't actually invent the word but well he certainly he uses did, it he popularized it most most philosophers use the word because it's a word in philosophy it's like saying ah uh richard brown invented the word epistemology because he uses it a lot this isn't an argument i'm still not understanding your argument here so the best evidence we have is that the, con the universe is not conscious we all evidence indicates consciousness requires brains the universe does not have a brain the universe is not conscious can so, you isolate a qualia can, can I, you establish I, the qualia I, exist? I, I, can I, I can experience it. But why, why, you can why experience do you it, but matter? that doesn't prove anything because you have no idea what the nature of the experience that you're having even yeah. is. You don't know what's under the hood. So that's called an argument from ignorance fallacy. Neither can you, but we can yes, use I the can. best evidence we can to show that no brain. Well, I know what consciousness, consciousness is. I have an answer for it. You don't. It's an entangled Making, photonic waveform. So making up an answer isn't actually. It's not a made up answer. It's a demonstrable fact. A demonstrable fact like well then you should win a nobel prize in philosophy because this well is i mean that's just problem. a silly thing to say i mean things get discovered all the time and now you get to yeah so if you've discovered it go win a nobel prize don't waste my time i don't care what you think you've discovered i don't need about i don't need your advice i don't need unsolicited advice mostly much less for actually me. you do actually you really do so if you think you've discovered something <laughs> tell the scientists otherwise you haven't discovered a damn thing don't waste my time with your uh, opinions. james i, I really don't need advice from this guy in terms of how to run my life so care. maybe he could come care. back to the so, actual point of the given debate how fiery is, it is we grumpy. might pardon my so, so we, we might jump into two minute intervals just to be sure there's no interrupting 
so, so yeah. So again, your opinion of what you think you have discovered is about as good as the drunk down the street's opinion on what he thinks he's discovered. Publish a paper and then you have evidence. Until then, you have an opinion. I don't care about your opinion. So if you think you've discovered or proven what consciousness is, demonstrate it or you haven't. And until you have done it and you demonstrated it to everyone that we can find a published paper to actually replicate these results, you have an opinion. I don't care about your opinion. I'm going to go with the consensus of experts who have demonstrated their results who show that consciousness is in brains. That is the best evidence. There is no other hypothesis accepted in the field at all um, because the best evidence indicates this. There are many, many examples of quotes, talking to actual neurologists, psychologists, cognitive scientists on my channel and on other channels where they literally explicitly say this, um, then you have nothing. You have an opinion. You think you, you've demonstrated consciousness, but that's not evidence. So I have no reason to accept your claim, your opinion. Therefore, the best evidence I have is that consciousness is produced by brains. There is no consciousness in the universe. Therefore, it's unreasonable to conclude the universe is conscious. And so I'm still trying to like understand your main point here. Like what are, are you arguing that what what is it what does divine mean by your definition perfect eternal the best you could i suppose you could think of a lot of words but uh, they have to meet a certain criterion of essentially undisturbed perfection and then you can go into well what's perfection Beauty, symmetry, these things all sort of allude to it. But it's all, it's an, essentially, it's an argument about how human emotion works. So it's like you seem ultra skeptical, but how skeptical have you been about your assumptions? For example, from your worldview, plants aren't conscious. It yeah, seems it was, a bit absurd to me. Well, it's not an assumption. It's just based off the fact that they don't have brains. It's based on induction. So it's not an how assumption. How do they grow but, then? Um, biology like not all biological things are conscious aren't they no i would say that that's a perfectly acceptable definition of consciousness is the difference between life and non-life uh, perhaps you're just a brain having supremacist and you just got no respect for the non-brain possessors of consciousness or I understand how brains work and how people can still have biological functions with no brains. And so they don't have any conscious experience of being alive, yet they're still living. So there's some difference between brain function, which is well, the consciousness thingy, and biology function, which, which, is, which is not. But again, so, so you said divine is perfection and perfection is something to do with human emotions. And because of this, we should call the universe god or something like i'm, I'm still yeah, well our emotions are sort of a guide they're the powerhouse because your cognition what you're calling consciousness is really just self-consciousness that's a subset of the total consciousness right because consciousness does it all no it so you can be you can be everything. no your conscious doesn't do any of those things but uh, well says you right wait, but wait, it's wait, like wait, just let me finish for a minute when it, so so you can be conscious and not be self-conscious like there are things that can have conscious experience and not be self-conscious so i'm not specifically talking about self-consciousness here but i still want to go down that route of so divine equals perfect equals human emotion which is a guide to what what is it guiding us how is it guiding us what is i'm making i'm, I'm not saying that there's a link between perfection and human emotions i'm saying that for religion to work it has to jive with your own emotions and so you should you let your emotions guide your own understanding of divinity let your you really emotions not have any guide your understanding of divinity what is so uh that means whatever is the most powerful thing in your emotions is what we should call divine is that right well it when you're using your rational mind to understand divinity, you shouldn't go against what your emotions are telling you. And that said, there's a limit to the amount of information that's valuable that can be derived from your emotions. So you have to use discernment to know when it's vestigial versus when it's a kind of a core thing. Some beliefs so, are just untenable is basically what I'm arguing. Okay. That, I, would, I do want to have some beliefs on uh... In the book. I would like to talk about that too. But so I just going down this first path. Um, so you said that when using our rational mind to understand divinity, we should not override or ignore our emotional parts or something like that. Like, 
you're I'll familiar. give you an example, okay? Let me give you an example. You go to an art display and there's a pile of feces on the ground and everyone's saying it looks really beautiful. And then they turn to you and, and you think, well, what, what do you, th and they say, what do you think? And then do you go along with what they're saying and saying, yeah, it's beautiful. Or do you say, actually, I, I think it's kind of gross and smells terrible. Yeah. I think it's a modern art museum and it's garbage. <laughs> but the question is, do you go with your heart or should you go with the crowd? Right. You should well, be going I, I with your heart, no matter what the crowd is saying is my point. Uh, well, I wouldn't go with my heart or the crowd. I would just look at the evidence and follow the evidence. So I would say that I could imagine having a feeling that I thought the crap was very beautiful. And then I'd say that, you know, this is probably just crap. Um, and so I would go against my feelings. I would say my feelings are probably wrong because we know of thousands upon thousands of fallacies, biases, illusions, delusions, hallucinations, where our feelings do a lot of work and make us feel one way, but we know that they're wrong. So like, you, I like your, your analogy is very good. It's like if there's these similar analogies in psychology all the time where you have sticks of different lengths and they have um, a V shape at the top, one V shape going up and one V shape going down. And they ask, well, which line looks longer? And the V shape going up seems like that line is going longer. Emotionally, you feel like that line is going longer. But then when you actually measure them, they're the exact same length. It's just an optical illusion. So emotions have the exact same kinds of optical illusions. They're called biases. So it's usually better to ignore your emotion because it doesn't tell you anything about reality and usually better to go with the rational side. So I, I would disagree with your premise that we should ig ig not eliminate our emotions or ignore our emotions when rationally assessing things. Everything we know, we know through our consciousness and the consciousness sure. pervades our body. It includes our emotions and our thoughts. So they should be integral, but the rational should trump the emotional. Sure. Because the emotional is basically headerless information. I don't okay. think they're necessarily at odds. This sort of what I'm getting at. Like a lot of people think that being rational means suppressing your emotions. Well, are but, there cases where they are at odds? Are there cases where you have an emotion towards something and yes. that emotion gives you a false belief? Uh, of course. Like the most common one is when somebody does something that offends you and you your feelings get hurt and you think they did it on purpose when 99.999% of the time it wasn't even on their radar. There's absolutely no intentionality to harm. Sure, sure. And so there That's, are. I see that all the time, basically daily. Definitely. I totally agree. So there are a, a lot of cases where your emotions lead you down the wrong path. So you need some additional criterion that's more important than the emotions to assess whether these emotions are correspond to reality or don't correspond to reality, because we know that emotions can do either. There's lots of examples of both. And so we need some other criterion independent of the emotions to assess, do these correspond to reality or don't they, right? You need axioms. So that's what I was going to ask you also at some point was like, what are your axioms and how do you square them with the fact that the starting point for everything you know is your own consciousness? What do you mean by axioms here? So I, I can have an axiom like there is a married bachelor in my garage. That could be an axiom. Um, well, most, most people who are rational and or scientific their de facto axiom is causality. So causes are separate from effects, causes lead to effects, and then basically science is speculation as to what those causes are, models, to then predict the effects. So I would say most people, when pressed, would agree at least on the surface with the causal axiom. So axioms are just like starting propositions. Uh, you can have anything be an axiom you want. Uh, Causality is actually rejected in many cases, like Hume showed you don't actually need causality, but irrelevant to the topic. So I would just reject him on uh, if anyone sure. didn't accept causality, I'd say, well, I'm not going to care what you say. That, that's fine. But it doesn't matter to the topic. So I'm not sure what you mean when you brought up axioms here. Like it depends on what your axioms are. Like I don't understand how that was relevant to my point. Well, you're asking about how do you disentangle emotional muck from your own understanding of reality and it's through axioms uh, yes but i'm asking like so so 
We know that emotions can give us true true ideas and false ideas. And so we need some other criteria, not, not just axioms. Axioms are just starting principles. You need something else, some other methodology, like you'd have to tell me what, what the axioms are that differentiate which of these emotional feelings are the correspond to reality and which ones don't. So, so what are the axioms you are using in addition or in, in taking your emotions, what axioms are you using to filter through those emotions to determine the real ones from the fake ones? Um, well, they're all identified. I don't want to say they're all identified as fake, but the method is to be in a state which is neither attachment nor aversion. So it's like a heightened awareness sort of state. So there's a neutrality. So the, the information you glean from having emotions is that thing gave me an emotional reaction. And that's so, your starting point. So we have emotions and those emotions by definition make us not neutral. We, we literally, we are feeling something towards something else. And, and so and then you're saying that the way we should assess whether this belief is true is just by being neutral towards a belief that we're not neutral about? Well, you need to have your starting point of beliefs, right? And I'm, I'm saying if you really don't want to believe anything and you don't want to take anything on faith, if you just accept causality, you can still derive all the rest of this other stuff as long as you explicitly state a sort of Occam's razor type of approach to science where you're saying, I will only accept the smallest, the shortest definition, basically the least, the lowest number of basis vectors, if you will. Like the, sure, I'm happy to grant complex answer. Well, I'm happy to grant all of that, but I'm a few steps further. So we, we've accepted causality. We're now on to uh, we have a feeling towards something, and we want, and we know we we we've both agreed that our feelings can give us false beliefs that don't correspond to reality. And so, in addition to these feelings, we have a feeling that belief X is true. Then in order to know if belief X is true, we can't just use our feelings. We need something else because we know that feelings could be both true or false. So we need an additional- All beliefs just come from the axioms. Beliefs come from axioms. Yeah, you can deduce beliefs from axioms as long as you state your imposed sort of architectural requisites, like Occam's razor, for example. Because multiple unified field models could predict everything, but only one of those unified field models is going to have the simplest form formalism. So it's a situation of like infinity right answers when you don't, when you just have axioms. But if you have axioms plus optimization criterion, yeah, you can get more or less, you can recover everything. Uh, I have no idea what you just said. So which axiom, like, to tell me which axiom I can use to determine when I go into the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa, if what I'm going to feel. You want to predict how you're going to feel when you look at the Mona Lisa? Yeah. You said your axioms can like differentiate or tell you what you're going to, um, what your emotions are going to be. Like, that's what you said. You said the beliefs. I didn't say that. No, no, no. That's, that's not what I'm saying. The, the model does make predictions, but the approach is, not about predicting your own emotions necessarily, it's about understanding them. So it's about understanding you have this huge bias, recognizing the bias, transcending the bias, and then cogitating without this bias sort of constantly overwhelming your reasoning faculties. Yes, and I'm asking, what is the methodology to do this? So we have a bias, we feel, we see the Mona Lisa, we feel something, or we have it, we form a belief because of our emotions. We but that's know. where you lost me there. That's not how beliefs work. You don't form a belief because of emotions. You have beliefs and your emotions are in some way influenced by them. Uh, so when I was a baby and I ate pizza for the first time, I formed a belief because of my experience. I did not have a belief about that's pizza. That's not prior. a belief. That's an opinion. Opinions are also beliefs. I don't, I don't, I don't understand the words you're using. So, um, uh, you don't see the difference between an opinion and a belief. A, a belief is a thing that colors all of your thoughts. An opinion is something that is just an anecdote in your life. It's like belief I like and opinion peaches. are synonyms. That's They're not literally synonyms. Like, like if, if <laughs> that isn't belief, like I have a, I have a belief that I enjoy X. You don't think beliefs are maybe more fundamental than opinions? 
Uh, no, don't even know what that means. Do you think logic is sort of, you're, you're, you're claiming that logic underpins your opinions? No. No. Okay. What are you claiming then? I'm claiming I have no idea the way you're using belief here. So, so again, I, I'm, my argument is we have an emotion. Um, like the emotion gives us a belief. Would you disagree so far? I don't agree that emotions give us okay. beliefs. I think the beliefs are more fundamental than emotions. Beliefs are more fundamental than emotions. So the biases and fallacies I mentioned before where we see two lines and they have big arrows on the top and we have a feeling that this one's longer than that one. Is That's it, an impression, not a feeling. I think I realize where we're having a failure to communicate. Uh, okay, so you have the impression loss aversion that, that it's, bias. Loss aversion bias is if I'm bet $10 and I don't want to lose the $10, I'm more likely to invest more rather than not investing in the first place. That's a feeling. So I have a feeling that when my money is already invested, I want to invest more to save it. Whereas if my money isn't invested, I'm less likely to invest it in the first place. That's a feeling. And it causes me to have a belief I don't want to invest my money. There's no belief there. Um, I'll give you a chance to respond, Jennifer, but just to tie this back to the original topic, I don't doubt that there is a way or a chain of reasoning that can explain how what we're discussing right now, like leads back to the original topic, but I want to give you a chance <laughs> to share that because for those who have just arrived, especially they are curious. <laughs> we're talking about whether we're just sort of interrogating each other's worldviews. I think I'm representing pantheism. T jumps representing atheism, but we got off on a bit of a tangent where he's inquiring into my approach to understanding things. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can just go back. So, so are all beliefs true? Well, obviously not, okay. but there's a way you could frame that question where the answer would be yes, because it depends on axioms, right? So if you define a belief to be a thing that is intrinsic to a person's mind that has an energetic value, well, yeah, they're all true in the sense that they all exist in people's minds in the sense that they espouse them. But do they accord with reality? Most of the time, no. And religion is what helps us bring our beliefs into line with reality, which prevents us from getting cognitive dissonance down the line because our expectations become realistic, which instills us with a sense of peace. So that all seems backwards to me. In philosophy, truth, reality is Maybe you're truth. backwards. So, so truth defined in philosophy, you can just Google the Stanford Encyclopedia, is truth is a property of sentences, whether or not the sentence corresponds to reality. So if you have a sentence that says the sky is blue, that sentence is true is because it describes reality. There's no truth in the sky. The truth is just in the sentence, whether the sentence describes reality or not. So whether or not a belief is true is the second thing you mentioned. Like I have a belief the sky is blue, if it's, it's true, if that belief corresponds to reality. So if beliefs can be both true and false, we need some way to differentiate the true beliefs from the false beliefs, right? Obviously, and that's what I'm, what I'm arguing that I have and you mm -hmm. don't. What is it? What is this magical method that you have that can differentiate true beliefs and false beliefs? I'm not sure what, what the, the word for it is exactly, but it's an ancient technique of science, which involves several steps and all ultimately comes down to the idea that calibrating your own consciousness is the best thing you can do to understand both yourself and the greater world. Okay, that's a description of it. Could you give me the steps? I want to know what is what is the method that I need to use to accurately differentiate true beliefs from false beliefs? It depends on the person because the method is sort of universal and the way that it can be universal is that it's specific to the person. So I would need to do an inventory with your beliefs and figure out where you're stumbling to get you to the next stage of realization. But where people are in their stages of realization varies drastically from one person to another. So there's no one cookie cutter approach and that's why it can be universal. So Not to sort of blow you off or anything. I do want to answer your question. I just uh, so that's well, just to, that seems like a contradiction to say it's universal, but then to say it's 
contingent on every single individual. Those are the opposite of one another. Well, are you but, familiar with archetypes? Are you familiar um, with um, Hippocrates' humorism? Not, not well, no. Are you familiar with, um, what do they call it, the uh, Myers-Briggs? Sure, sure. Do you agree with it? No. <laughs> I think it's kind of goofy, right? But hypothetically, if there were a system that actually did classify people archetypally, and it was predictive. So the issue with Myers-Briggs and ultimately where, why uh, humorism fell apart was because it's not predictive. The way that it's classifying people at archetypes is not predictive of their actual behavior. So it's not scientific. Sure. But there is one that is actually scientific, where if you canonize people this way, throw them into their archetype, it will make a degree of predictions about the overall, uh, their body and their mind and their life. And the reason it works is because there's multiple archetypes. And so people are going to fit somewhere in that continuum. And so it's uni something is universalizable when their archetype basis spans the real basis of humanity. So it's, it's not, things aren't always universalizable, but they could hypothetically be universalizable if they could account for human uniqueness. Okay, um, I still need to know what it is. So like my method, if you ask me, how do you differentiate imagination from reality? I'm going to say novel testable predictions, make a model, use the model to predict the future. If you can do that accurately, consistently, reliably, testably, then you can differentiate imagination from reality. So mine is pretty universal. It doesn't matter. No subject makes a difference whatsoever. Now, what is, can you give me like, or just pick any random person. It doesn't need to be me or any individual. What is the method that a gen generic average person should use to differentiate true beliefs from false beliefs there's no such thing as a generic average person I'm you can afraid. pick any at random just the simplest one that is easy to explain um for most people would be to find a good role model and ask them to tell them what they did to get to their result that would be for most people because to find a role model you're already starting on the path that you need to be on which is self-study which is like, okay, what kind of role model do I want? What kind of person uh, am I going to trust to bring me to a higher level of functioning? You mentioned find a role model and understand your motivations, uh, something like that. And I'm not seeing how that gets us to true beliefs. Like, for example, let's say I have no role model. Does that make me incapable of finding true beliefs or, or if I have no motivations or just my motivation is just to find truth or something like I don't see how that any either of these are relevant to finding truth or how they can help me to find truth well what the person who will be a role model does is give you a basis of beliefs that are a starting point then you're basically saying you can deduce your own beliefs you don't need uh, anyone to tell you. You can just look at what's there and figure it out. Well, I'm seeing how is the role model himself relevant to the finding truth thingy? Because it seems like that's irrelevant. Like, as Because you that's the truth. And in all of history, that's how it was done. The truth is that people found knowledge through the tradition of Guru Shishyo, which is sort of like a role model, i.e. being directly indoctrinated by someone who's already a master. And so... There's not really any other way to do it other than revelation. Uh, so you can find a role model who's a bad role model, right? There, there are bad role models. Then you should lead. find a new one. You got to take the onus on yourself to get the result. You got to say, I'm only going to accept the best. And sure. you don't want to necessarily marry yourself to this person's beliefs and say, I'm going to just be a carbon copy of them. No, they're, the point of that person is to give you a basis of understanding from which you further refine your own understanding. Sure. So, but uh, the question here is if we want to know what truth is and it's possible to find both good um, role models and bad role models, then just finding a role model doesn't help us find truth. We need, we need something else, right? Because the role model, we could find a role model who's bad and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless we have some other Wait criteria. till you find the one that you are reasonably sure has the truth. Well, that's, that's the thing we're asking for is that reasonably sure has the truth. How do yep. you assess which one has the truth? Is it just 
find a role model and find your motivations. No, it's got to be something else. We got to use some Results other set of. Results is the most important thing. Reputation is part of it, and what they've written, I guess. So Donald Trump has some pretty good results, President of the United <clears throat> States. Uh, he's definitely written a lot. There are lots of people who think he's very successful and probably he's more well-educated than many of his followers. So he's their role model. Um, where is the problem And if problem you choose here? Donald Trump as your guru, you probably have pretty bad karma and hopefully you learn the lesson that he's not really fit for that role. Sure. He may have some successes, but he's hardly a role model. Well, that's the question here. We want to understand how do we differentiate true beliefs from false beliefs? You said find a role model. We can find role models who are not very good. People can use all of the methods you just mentioned and still lead to false beliefs pretty regularly. So those don't seem like very good methods. Or, or is, is, is Yeah, it sucks to, it? to be human. We're sort of stuck under the boot of God. We can never have uh, what you're alluding to, which is an objective understanding. My method sort of seems to work stuck. pretty good at that, but you don't know what consciousness is. You deny that it's an entangled photon waveform, which would appear to be self-evident through process so, of elimination from Occidental science. So, so if it's self-evident, then why did no one two thousand years come up with it? That would kind they of they did mean it's believe nuts. that they axiomatize quantum mind in Vedanta. So it's it's only the post Christians who don't. So I'm just wondering, like, when are they going to catch up to That's what everyone's to me, believed but, forever? Um, so again, uh, again, that seems like by definition, not self-evident, but you, you can take that position. Well, if you it's want. like, I'm looking at you and you're this like totally symmetric animated figure and you're composed of carbon and all a bunch of other random stuff. And most carbon I look at doesn't look anything like you. So the difference between that carbon and you has to be something that is organizing you to look the way that you do. The only thing in physics that fits that bill is a photon waveform. So much there, not 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 correct about physics, but different topic. Um, I have a I have a degree in physics, and I worked in applied physics for several years. Yeah, well, then you may want to get a refund. But so, so it has nothing to do with applied electron waveforms. It's not correct. Um, waveforms aren't electron waveforms. There's, there's lots of different kinds of things. I said photon waveform. Photon not electrons. So, so again, photon waveforms, no, it's not, no, but it doesn't get well, you're, you're my saying question. no, so, and you have no idea if I'm right. So, I, I do, I, I know I for a fact you're wrong. A lot, so is is they want to just say no, they don't want to be like you need to be more skeptical, skeptical about your skepticism. You're just like saying no off hop. Is that wise? Uh, you yes, have no idea when, if I'm right. No, yeah, we know for a fact you're wrong. So, but I don't, that's not the topic. So, the topic is or the, the question I've been asking, how do we differentiate true beliefs from false beliefs? And you gave really bad, provably false criteria of find a mentor and um, know your emotional biases or something like that. Uh, and those don't work. We can prove those do not work. Finding a mentor does not give you the truth. Knowing your emotional biases does not give you the truth. We can prove both of those very clearly. So you need some other criteria. You need something more than that. And you just said, oh, well, it just sucks to be human because we can't come up with a better criteria than those two objectively terrible criteria. And I'm like, no, we can come up with a much better criterion, which is objective, independent of thoughts, independent of subjectivity. It's called science. It works really, really well. Novel testable predictions work really, really well. They don't use things we've proven to be fallacies, like finding a mentor, appeal to authority fallacy, or trusting your emotions, appeal to emotion fallacy. We know those don't work, but we know what does work, which is science. So, so my method seems objectively significantly better. So than appeals to science authority are okay. But appeals to established authority through thousands of years of tradition are crazy and couldn't possibly be right. Uh, yes, because one has a basis in a methodology which can be demonstrated to work. One has a basis in a methodology which can be demonstrated to not work. Science doesn't have any way of telling us whether a theory is true. Uh, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. It can only falsify a theory. There's no uh, such thing as proving no. a science theory. There's only a failure to disprove. Yeah, that's only if you require 100% certainty for knowledge, which is not the case. It's called fallibilism. You do not require certainty for knowledge, so you can't have knowledge without certainty, in which case we can demonstrate that evolution is true. Do we need to prove it with 100% certainty? No. Um, but again, that is that method that we have for science is infinitely better than the one you just provided. 
even though all your answers are wrong, Big Bang's wrong, evolution's wrong, the periodic table's not two dimensions, it's three, you don't understand consciousness, you can't prove reincarnation, you don't understand quantum mechanics, you've invented a infinity fake particles that don't really exist to build a gigantic onanistic uh, CERN machine to convince yourselves how smart you are, what results do you actually have to show for this quote-unquote wonderful science? Uh, computers, airplanes, vaccines, the improved life expectancy, the improved quality of life, uh, everything we've ever designed and built, all science. What is yours done? Given a unified field model of physics is proved the Goodell and Completus theorem, proven reincarnation, proven the nature of consciousness, given a unified field model for consciousness. I could go on for a while, but I don't think you accept the premise of what I'm saying. Premise. What premise? The, you you think I'm some but. crank who just wants to use big words to sound smart. Do you have any idea how hard that would be? About it's probably be easier just to Deepak know something. Chopra. Uh, not, no. There's a lot more cranks who pretend to know things than people who actually know things. Dunning Kruger. But where where did you prove any of these things? Like, have these been proven in any scientific papers that I can I can reference? Sure, entanglement's been demonstrated at a macro scale. Uh, the science. entangled photons are being used for new quantum computers. By science. Um, there well, was a did, Forbes article recently things? that was fairly good. Well, well these like, things I'm, are consistent with my findings. I haven't published anything because that's not how I work. I'd rather have oh, right. one-on-one Let conversation. Just, clarify. just want to clarify. So those things were all discovered by science, the methodology of science, not the methodology you're using. So I want to know, using your methodology, what has your methodology produced, not what has science produced? So, so like the reincarnation thing would be great. Science has not done that. So if you can give me some evidence of that, that would be great. Sure. Well, you have to accept the position that the mind is a quantum computer, namely a entangled photon waveform, which you already said couldn't possibly be true, even though there's evidence that the body generates a mag electromagnetic field. And electromagnetic fields are mediated by photons. Okay, let's go back to resurrection. How does this show resurrection? It doesn't show resurrection. You're talking about Christianity. Re sorry, re There's no resurrection. There's no zombie God. Yeah, yeah, reincarnation. I'm dyslexic, so the R is reincarnation. Oh, that's fine. Um, okay, so yeah, it's uh well, does your consciousness contain energy? It is energy, sure. So it 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 contains energy or it is energy. And is energy conserved? Yes. Sure. Science told us that. So therefore, reincarnation is the answer that is predicted through conservation of energy. It's just a question of what aspect of consciousness is actually reincarnated because most of us don't remember anything. Mo most but you can explain why that is. Again, you can explain why the memories are purged because our primary imperative is survival and remembering a bunch of previous lives would be more information than we would know how to deal with because we need all of our focus on surviving in the now, or at least that's what our biology believes. Uh, well, we definitely don't. We have lots of memories of Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and things. So we can definitely have alternate lives in there. That's perfectly fine. But I'm, I'm not getting this. So uh, this cup is made of electrons. It has energy. It gets re recycled into a metal beam. Has it reincarnated? Well, I mean, if you want to look at it that way, you could, but I don't know why you would. You do realize your own consciousness is centralized in a way that the consciousness of the cup, if we can call it that, is not centralized. Your consciousness appears to emanate from this point correct? Sure. So it has a quality of centralization that the cup really doesn't have. Okay, so All does the centralization thing reincarnate? Part of it does. So the way I explain it is you have a personality and your thoughts are derivative of your personality, your emotions are derivative of your personality, and your sensations are derivative of your personality in the sense that you're the one who experiences the things that you feel. It's all centralized around your personality. Okay, so let's so say my... Go ahead. The, the first way that I would sort of tease you to kind of look at it is like, where'd your personality come from? So what materialist science wants to say is that you're like a mashup of your parents. But I think 
you seem to have a developed enough personality that you would essentially disagree with that position. Are you the well, oldest uh, child? Yes. So our personality it comes shows. from a combination <laughs> of neurology uh, and so nature and nurture, science, psychology, and neurology. So you're of the belief that uh, you're basically a blank slate that your experience painted onto you. No. So neurology is determined by biology. And so many of your okay. beliefs and things are determined prior to any psychology. There's no blank slate. Okay. So there's a, a biological pre-existing imperative. And where does that come from? Biology. Just your parents. So you're, you're basically saying you're, you feel like you're a combination of your parents, just a mashup a random mashup of your parents? You don't feel like it, a distinct entity from either of your parents? Sure. My consciousness is an emergent property of my brain, and the biology in my brain is a result of the genes which were came from my parents and some mutation. Um, are, are you sure you believe that? So what do you? how do you predict the yes. differences between you and your siblings' personalities? What explains that? Just randomness? It's not very uh, satisfying, is it? Well, it... No, it's not randomness. It's for deterministic factors of the genes, which can change different things in your brain. Robert Sapolsky, Stanford uh, professor, has gone through and showed that if you change these specific genes, it has this specific effect on your personality. One of the ones I like the best is the one that causes uh, a significantly negative impact to stress. So if you have stress one time, it has a like a 10, a factor of 10, and then it starts to go up exponentially for people who have this gene. And so stress for them is overwhelming and causes them PTSD, even if they're as a child. So whereas most people, it's, it's a steady, steady rate. It's not exponential. So yes, we do know these genes do have a very profound effect on personality in combination to the uh, effects or the things that happen to them while they're children. And what explains the distinction between the personalities of siblings? The differences in their genes can cause different effects in their and brain. And what explains and their those differences. differences in their genes are the same parents? Uh, mutation. So that's what I'm saying. You're back to an appeal to randomness. Mutation isn't any type of answer. That's not how it works. The, the genetic uh, record does not support a slow process in evolution. It supports what's called punctuated equilibrium, which is not predicted by evolution by natural selection through mutation. Punctuated equilibrium and invented by, uh, what's his name? I forgot. The guy who... He recently died, but uh, yeah, that still takes a long time. Punctuated equilibrium takes the exact same amount of time as uh, natural selection and random mutation. It just changes on different scales. So it's, it's they're, they're the same thing. There's not like different time scales. Like punctuated equilibrium just means that there's a large collapse in the population. So a very small subset of the population continues to reproduce and then is affected by random mutation. So those are both parts of evolution. Like those, I don't, I don't know what you're saying here. And and so yes those would still explain personality. I, I still don't understand how this is relevant to my question of how, how your criteria actually show us true beliefs and false beliefs or so, or actually what I think I'm explaining to you that your it. belief about genetic determinism is wrong and should have been self evidently wrong due to the fact that there was absolutely no insight provided by these details. And so uh, uh, well, alleged revelations that have to be, you have to appeal to mutation and genetic randomness. Not that's understand. not any like, type what do, of answer. What do, you mean, what do you mean that's not any type of answer? Like, I'm not getting this. So we know that this gene affects this thing in the brain, which causes this personality trait. Which and why that's is that not, not how it answer? works. What do you mean it's not how I literally gave you a, a published academic resource that has proven this. That doesn't prove anything, I'm afraid. You still what? don't have an answer as to what consciousness even is. Neither do these people, but you're question. assuming their interpretations of consciousness studies are right. I don't, that's a different question. So can I use changes in genetics to tell us what personality Predict. traits are going to happen? Yes. You can possibly alter aspects of the body through genetics, which has to do with the mind to some, to some extent, but you can't fundamentally change the personality through genetic manipulation. Stress yes, is can. not that's an attribute what radiation of the personality. So, so radiation causes genetic mutation and it kills people and it causes all kinds of personality changes. Uh, Phineas Gage got a rod shoved up his brain and it completely changed its personality, which was due to a specific part of the brain, which you can damage through genetics. And we can know, for example, that yes, the genetics will damage this part of the brain and cause this personality trait difference. I don't understand what you're saying here. Like just basic science would help a lot here. Okay, so the basic science is 
that your approach is completely wrong. The mind comes first, and it's an entangled photon waveform, and it synchronizes to the fetus at five weeks, which is what starts the heartbeat. And then the body starts to feed the mind, and the mind starts to deform the body. And the reason you're reincarnated to your parents is because they, between the two of them, shared the maximum amount of possible attributes with you, which is why there's similarities between children and their parents. Okay, and so this field of- that started you at five weeks is still something that if we had the right tools, we could actually identify this field inside you right now. That would be great. Once you have those, let me know. That'll be good evidence. Um, well, you don't so really it, need evidence, do you? Why does yes. life look so radically different from non-life? There's only possible one Doesn't. explanation, which is a photon field to organize it all. It doesn't it doesn't look radically different. There's no actual definition of life because when you look at biological forms and chemical reactions, they look identical. You can't tell the difference between them when you go to small levels. So they don't look different. Um, this but, pencil is very different from a turtle. Sure. Right? So there's because, clearly a difference between life and non-life. And I'm saying it's an entangled <sighs> photon waveform and that makes the predictions. And it's been demonstrated that photosynthesis function on a basis of quantum mechanics. You have no reason to deny it. But for some reason, you want to because of this genetic determinism thing. But what I'm telling you is it's extremely depressive belief system. Okay, so those well, are why would you want to believe something that's so totally so, depressing? So those are three completely unrelated facts. One, the biology and photosynthesis. Yes, quantum mechanics has an effect on everything. That's irrelevant to the, the point about how there's a difference between life and non-life, which has nothing to do with pencils and turtles. It has to do with chemical interacting systems and biological interacting systems like we can't define life there is no definition of life the one you presented does not work on waveform i I just gave you a definition you can make up one i can make up life as a potato that'll make the predictions all life will have an entangled photon waveform you can find it even the simplest life and indeed it's this waveform that distinguishes life from non-life because i understand that the pencil has a trivial photonic way it has a trivial waveform i get it i don't know if you want to say it's photonic but it's it has some type of a trivial waveform. I'm not talking about that, though. For it to be alive, it has to have a non-trivial photonic waveform. And the function of this waveform is to centralize information. Okay, so demonstrate this waveform. Like, show me where, where can we find this? What test can we do to prove this? Do you have any testable you, papers published? You can look up bio, uh, bioelectric field. They've definitely established that it exists. I'm just going a step further and saying it's there. It's the thing that's that animates your body. It's the reason you don't collapse. It's the reason why you're puffed out and, you know, not yes. uh, So biological up. electrical fields exist. Yes. What does this have to do with life? I'm going a step further and saying that a subset of this field is your subjective consciousness and all life will have some type of a, an entangled photonic field. Okay, and I can say that there's a magical leprechaun somewhere hiding in my. You could say you could fighting. say that, but, right, right, but it so the really question is, is what's the difference? That's because yours seems to be equally as coherent as magical leprechaun pixies. How does knowing when you reincarnate at five weeks? How does knowing where your personality comes from and why you have your parents? How is that somehow linearly equivalent to ma? purple ponies like give me a break here purple pony exactly so it's like it seems like you've made up a bunch of stuff with no evidence i didn't make it. any of this stuff wait, 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 up i, I, you, I mean what, what, to, what's made answer, up trying to answer your question here so it seems like you've made up a bunch of stuff about this reincarnation at five weeks which has no evidence this biological field which has no evidence there's nothing in science that supports any of this you just have an opinion as far as i can tell um like what you mentioned was as you said this is all all of the science is consistent with your worldview so that's post hoc reasoning All of science is consistent with every worldview. You can say we were created five minutes ago by leprechauns. You could say the world was created 6,000 years ago by Yahweh, and he just made everything look like uh, it was 13.8 billion years old or whatever. All of the past data can be explained by any worldview. What we need is some novel predictions to show that your worldview has something more, and just explaining all the past stuff doesn't get us anywhere. We can all make up explanations. Purple ponies can make up all the explanations just as well as yours can. Why should we think yours is better than purple ponies? Mine actually makes predictions. What are the predictions? For example, it predicts that when you're sleeping, the energetic center of your mind moves outside of your brain. How do so we measure that? Brain... Sorry? How do we measure that? Our energetic center moves outside of our brain. What, is that? what does that mean? How do we measure it? 
they have tons of studies on people sleeping where they've established the various, um, what do they call it? REM sleep and all the different waves. Well, that's There's all in the like, brain. You said this goes like outside of the body or something. Well, the body is inside the, the consciousness. It's a subset. Okay. I'm not understanding your prediction here. So you, you've made a prediction that the center of our energy moves somewhere to somewhere else. Where okay, is so it you have a bot, you have a body, right? We can agree on that. And then your mind encompasses your body, but it has an energetic center right here. And that's okay. why it feels like our thoughts are emanating from somewhere around here. Right. Okay. We can all pretty much agree with that. That doesn't mean consciousness comes from the brain. That means that, that it has an energetic center in the brain. That's the point of the brain is to facilitate the centralization in the mind. <clears throat> okay. And, this and so when you're sleeping, when you're sleeping, the purpose of sleeping is to not basically electrocute your brain to uselessness because there's a lot of energy being discharged into your brain through the quantum mechanics of your mind because it's photons, right? Photons, light, energy, <laughs> So you get tired, go to sleep, and the prediction of the model is that the energetic maximum should move outside of the brain while you're sleeping. Outside and of the brain. So outside of like the scientific, physical brain in your head, it goes somewhere else. Where does it go? What's well, the geodesic? So it's the place that would take the least energy. So you're... You understand the idea that your consciousness is sort of burning out your brain and it, your brain needs a, a periodic... Uh, Rest. Well, if, if your consciousness is the biological electrical signals in your brain, then yes. Like in, in materialism, in the materialistic worldview, then yes, we need to shut down the brain so that it can heal and cool off and not overload. It's the same thing if it's a photon waveform too, because both the electric and the photonic have energy in them. So not presumably sure either this... way, either way, uh, whichever model ends up being right, hint, it's mine, uh, you'd need to sleep at some point. But the idea is that when you're awake, you have an imperative to project your personality, and that imperative is inhibited when you're sleeping. So your consciousness has to do some work to inhibit its subjectivity, which is okay, why you so, fall so, immediately. In, so here's, here's how it predicts things. When, when you go to sleep, you fall immediately into the deepest part of sleep, and then you're slowly coming out of it. And that's consistent with the idea of a system that is like, okay, we've got to fix it. Goes in, takes you to the maximum of inhibition, lowest. Uh, I'm, I'm not form. following. I'm not following. I'm just, oh, sorry to interrupt, but so do, do you know how it works when you sleep? The different waveforms. It's not waveforms. It's frequencies of sleep, or yeah, alpha, I don't know how gamma, they say it. Delta. Yes, but I don't understand your, your, your what you said was is that you make a prediction that the center of energy of your body or something changes. The center moves. of energy of your mind should move out of your brain. Moves out of your brain. So, and then you said something about geodesics, which is the shortest distance between two points on a curved surface. I have no idea what that really. No, no, to a here. geodesic is just the shortest distance between two points. So it's like your body's going to expend minimum energy to do this. So exactly what I said, but where? So you said the center of energy thing moves. So it, it starts in location A, moves to location B. Now location A is here. Where is location B? Can you point to it, please? The prediction of my model would that be that it's a donut around your eyes. Okay. So so it moves. That's from the here geodesic, and then, and then right? Goes here. That's the that would be the geodesic. Uh, because if it can't be here and it has to fulfill the minimum energy solution, it's going to go right beside it, okay, but it's okay. going to maintain so, that so circular we, tubular shape. How can we demonstrate that there is this new energy thingy over here? How do we do that? Because I've never seen this donut that energy would be thingy. Un, that would be unethical, wouldn't it? Unethical? Well, you, you can infer it from the measurements of people's brainwaves when they're sleeping, because if they have longer, fre or longer wavelength, that means there's less energy. Because wavelength is inverse to frequency, and frequency determines energy. What do you think those wavelengths are measuring? The mind. What, what in the mind? The brain. What, what in the brain are they measuring? Well, it's a waveform, and waveforms have more than one frequency, but at least one frequency, right? So it's measuring one of those frequencies. So it's a measuring an electrical signal that goes up and down. In it's the photons. The, the EEGs are photon measuring photons. Field. 
It's a photon field. So, so a photon waves, field can then know. excite an electric field, but a photon field on its own has no charge. Okay, so EEGs, what they're measuring in the brain is an electrical signal in the brain. They're not, there's nothing outside of the brain they're measuring. They don't, that's why they put the little stickers on your head and not outside of your head. Are you saying that if they put the stickers above your head, they're going to get a stronger reading because it's closer to this donut thingy? I don't know how they would be measuring the light form because they may only be able to measure the electrical correlates of the light form. Okay, so then so they, how would you measure the I light wouldn't, form? Because it's uh, unethical, because it would be interfering with someone's consciousness, and that would be unethical. Well, we can measure it while it's in the brain, can't we? You can measure correlates of consciousness. You can measure... My guess what it is, is that the brain is generating the consciousness, and that waveform is something to do with the energy going into the mind from the brain. Because that's what the purpose of the body is, right? Is okay, to okay. put so, energy so, into the mind. Sure. So, so my question was, is how do you measure the donut thing? You're saying that you made a prediction that there, it starts here and then moves here. And that's, that's I want to see the here thingy. So I grant it's here. I grant I'm telling you it's unethical. That, that's fine. So, so you can't do it. You make a prediction that you cannot verify. Well, Not, you can verify it by looking at the EKG or electrocardiograms and, and saying, or whatever they are, the brain grams. You can look yeah. at those and say there's a, Longer wavelength, which means lower frequency, which means less energy. Yeah. So I'm saying, how do you show that the, that measurement from the EEG shows that there's something outside of your brain that is moved outside of your brain, isn't just in your brain? How I suppose that... it wouldn't directly show that, but that the existence of that field is what allows for the rest of the thing to make sense. So, so I could say the existence of magical leprechauns controlling my brain is what causes the measurement. Your of the brain model control. has no centralization potential function. You don't, um, you're, you cannot tell me how the brain centralizes consciousness. That's your Centralization issue. potential function. That's, that is not a, those are all adverbs. Those don't, that doesn't form a sentence. You need a you need Centralization. A what is it that holds it all together? It's not an electric field. It is. It's literally the centralization, the consciousness itself is a system of electric signals in your brain. The collection of all those signals, that's the centralization. It's not in the neurons. It's not in the, the thalamus. It's not in the spinal cortex. It is literally the combination of all the electrical things happening at the same time. That is it. So it is centralized. But... I, I'm ready to go to the q and I'm, I'm burned out. Like this is so much, so much silly. Well, stuff. thank you for, um, thank you for showing up and for, I appreciate hearing what, what your points are and I hope you'll give what I'm saying a chance and I'll say to the people in the audience, hopefully they got some good out of this conversation. Yeah. You're pleasant to talk to. You're not mean or anything. So I do appreciate you being kind and talkative and I enjoy talking with you. You seem cool too. And like, I definitely am not trying to push you to change your beliefs. I just thought, uh, that maybe I could convince you of the validity of my God, and maybe one day you'll try it on and see how it fits. I'm going to need a much more thorough definition first. Just super, the universe. super, super <laughs> juicy. And want to say, folks, we are thrilled to have you here. I want to remind you that Modern Day Debate is a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics, and we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from, Christian, atheist, pantheist, you name it, folks. We're glad you're here, and we're going to jump into these juicy questions from you, so thanks so much for your questions, folks, and boy, I am so excited. First, because Tom and Jennifer, I have to tell you, so much positive feedback. People have really enjoyed this conversation, and they're going to, I think they're going to continue to enjoy it. A lot of juicy questions, many, many to come, but a lot of big, juicy things coming up. So Bubblegum Gun says, first, calculators require a mind to exist. Awful argument. I think that's for you, Jennifer. I was trying to point to the fact that cogito ergo sum is actually a fallacy. So the fact that you think is not proof that you exist. Uh, it's actually the other way around. So I just wanted to bring attention to that. Perhaps my example could have been better. I'll think about it for next time. Thanks. Gotcha. And let's see. Jason Hancock, thanks for your question, says, but why don't you believe in God, Tom? Uh, Maybe they're new. <laughs> I do believe in God. The chair is the God. 
juicy. And Alex Gross, thanks for your question, says, if God is real, then why did he give me man boobies? Thanks for that, Alex. We definitely appreciate that. Dwayne Burke, thank you very much for your, says, Tom's chair killed Carol Baskin's ex-husband. Could be. And this one coming in from Hydrup X says, intellectuals don't have much common sense unless they get it from a book. I don't know who that's supposed to insult because you're both intellectual types. So maybe both of you. <laughs> but the next one, the Crawdaddy029, if you want to respond, you can. But to that last one, otherwise I'll jump to the next one. I don't know if you care to. Next one. Sure, even. Yeah. <laughs> the Crawdaddy029 says, Pantheism? Ju- just saw Thor and said, quote, he can hammer me. Oh my gosh. Okay, Alan Bipree, thanks for your question. Said Jennifer, that was a delicious word salad. Giving you some heat from the chat. Jennifer, what is your answer to these people who claim that you're creating word salad? I uh don't really know what to say because I've spent years trying to make this stuff as simple as possible. Like I, I absolutely love religion and really gives me a lot of benefits. And I've tried to present it in a way that atheists really can't disagree with because I know a lot of people are atheists. And so I've done a lot of work in science and I think it speaks for itself, but uh, we didn't really get a chance to go into exactly how the model makes the predictions that it does and the strength of it. But perhaps we could do that at a later time and it'll become more self-evident because T-Jump still seems to be a little uncomfortable with some of the suppositions or possibly all of them. Gotcha. And also want to remind you folks, just a friendly reminder, 99.9% of you, thank you. You do a fantastic job naturally of attacking their arguments instead of the person. We appreciate that. For the other 1%, want to remind you, we do want to obviously encourage you to attack the arguments instead of the person. And... This one coming in from Farron Salas. Thanks so much. Says, sounds like Jen's argument are Dipity's basically sophistry combined with Deepak Chopra isms in an attempt to conflate God with or as the universe. Jennifer, is this true? That, are you borrowing anything from Deepak? No, I am not. I am just trying to share my understanding through concepts that you're already familiar with, like photons and all the things from science, but it's a bit of an uphill battle because not everyone has the same ideas about what science is. And so I appreciate people continuing to come with questions and hopefully I'll wipe away all your doubts before long. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this question coming from Amy Newman says after show, after the debate at my channel, And that is linked in the description, folks. And Amy will be here tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have a juicy one, folks, in particular, whether or not trans children should be able to take puberty blockers. So it's going to be a juicy political type debate tomorrow that you don't want to miss, folks. And Amy also says, as Amy will be in that debate, that's why I mentioned that. So Amy says, hi, T-Jump. Question for Jennifer. What would it take to convince you that the concept of a god is not real? Hi, Amy. Well, the concept, you can't argue against whether a concept is real. You can argue about whether it's literally real. And I'm identifying God as the universe, so that's real. Pretty demonstrably real. And you're not really coming back with a counter thesis. So what it would take for me to change my mind would be somebody who had a better scientific theory than me, i.e. one that made more predictions. Gotcha. And jumping into this next question, thanks so much. Robert Summers says, Jennifer, how many gods do you believe in? (laughs) There are a lot of ideas about God out there. Some of them are worth studying for moral lessons. How many really exist as a matter of axioms, but my in my own understanding, I identify one God, as, and that's the universe. You got it. And thank you very much for this question coming in from Ra Nakedness says, you can avoid subjectivity via epistemic criticism of a conceptual system as a whole from the standpoint of another conceptual system. 
think that's for you, Jennifer. I'm not sure if that's a question. Um, so yeah, super chat. We let people, if they want to ask a question or raise a quick objection, either or. Well, I'll just comment that you can't, I, I don't think you can effectively disprove someone else's position without offering a counter thesis. So in order to do that, in order to disprove someone's position, yes, it may be true that you do need a counter thesis and that just saying no, 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 what will only go so far in actually convincing people. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this question coming in from Hi Derp X says, where does T Jump get his morals from? The chair. Next up, writer John Buck. But wait, you do believe in objective morality, though, so let's humor them. Oh, okay, sure. So I think I use the evidence of moral interest to moral progress to create a principle that describes the pattern in those things. Then I use the principle to infer what the maximization of this principle would be. And then from that, I try to conclude what the ontology of morality would be. And I think it's a higher order emergent property in nature. Gotcha. This one coming in from writer John Buck says, what gives? I thought Tom was already a naturalistic pantheist. Why is he arguing for atheism? Uh, naturalistic pantheism is not the same thing as pantheism. Uh, and yes, I am. I will technically take the position of naturalistic pantheism for the sake of the argument. But yeah, it's just that it's just science. Naturalistic pantheism is just science. Juicy Beef Wellington, thanks, says unrelated to the debate. So feel free not to read. Just wanted to support the channel and put in a request for a Bitcoin debate. Thank you very much for your support of the channel, seriously. And we are actually open to a Bitcoin debate. I've like pondered potential people that we might invite. So it might actually happen. And Robert Summers, and we're shooting for the stars. There's somebody that if we got him on, I'd be like, I can't believe it. But anyway, Robert Summers thinks your question says, what is your worldview's answer to biodiversity? Uh, I think that's for Jennifer, but I'm not sure. Oh, maybe we can both answer it. Gotcha. Well, biodiversity is not a question. It's a word so the way to look at it is through the lens of minimizing suffering and understanding that there's more than one way to minimize suffering all of life is conscious and so the best outcome will be taking into account the most widest array of, of consciousness and understanding how if other people are happy we are also happy same with animals and everything else. And so biodiversity would be considered a good thing and something that you'd want to promote as much as possible without uh, impeding the progress of civilization because you kind of have to negotiate between the needs of civilization and the needs of the greater natural sphere in which we exist. So it's an important question, but it would take quite a long time to give you a full answer. So I hope that's a good introduction. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Do Appreciate It, Robert Summers says, this debate can be summed up by Hitchens Razor. Jennifer, you can redefine science as we know it, and you want to hold that in? Why prove any of this? I would have to say, what are your conditions for proof? Because a lot of people th seem to think you can prove things scientifically can only disprove things scientifically. And then when it comes to accepting a proof, you have to have what are called axioms. So it's like, these are my conditions for which I would accept a proof and stick to those. And then someone can rise to that standard. But if you're just obstinately saying you want proof, you're basically playing a game of perpetual goalpost shifting where you can always just retreat to well, it's uh, just as plausible as the purple pony where it's like you're not in a position to as to assert the likelihood of the truth of my statements if you don't really understand them, are you? Gotcha. And this one coming in from L the Batman, also throwing some heat, says, Tom, getting beat worse than usual. <laughs> so next up, logical, plausible, probable. By the way, I have not mentioned, folks, both Tom and Jennifer are linked in the description. So if you want to hear more in terms of their content, in terms of their ideas, what are you waiting for? You can click on their links right now. And we really do appreciate our debaters. They are the lifeblood of the channel, folks. And so logical, plausible, probable. Tom's twin brother, John Maddox, says, so James doesn't have a blazer on. 
I took it off earlier. I get really sweaty when we have our tech problems. It says this isn't normal. Was he getting action before the debate? Nasty guy. It says inquiring minds, James. In- inquiring mind. Nasty guy. We you know we keep him around though. Next up, Robert Summers says. Oh, King 024, I meant, says, a question for Jennifer. Please show the photonic wave field in a virus. Are viruses alive? The way I understand it is that they're kind of like uh, not alive per se. They're crumbs lopped off of life that are part of the life cycle, but can't self-replicate without a DNA-based organism. Like a, a virus can't replicate just with other viruses and that's kind of your condition for for life so whether it has or doesn't have a trivial photonic waveform would be a matter of whether it's in proximity to a living form so i unfortunately don't have my normal demonstration here i would do one but uh, it all sort of slides in together through the light field but no, I don't think it necessarily has one if it's just a, an inert virus. And this is why you can crystallize viruses. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this one. Insect Facet says, Jennifer, can you point to a working, useful device that you built using your discoveries? Mainstream science built my car and my computer, etc." This is not uh, a regressive Luddite appeal to modern technology being bad. I am simply trying to elucidate the fact that a lot of people don't have a particularly fulfilled spiritual life and that maybe having a car and an iPhone and a soy drink anytime you want, maybe there's a little more to that than actually leading what you would consider in retrospect to be a good life. I'm not anti-technology to the point where, you know, I, I just don't want people to be unnecessarily suffering. And yes, wanton use of technology with no consideration for the results will lead to a lot of suffering through environmental degradation. So not a Luddite, love technology, but that cannot be the supreme goodness that we're all aspiring to. So it's just going to lead to idiocracy with a bunch of trash piles everywhere. Gotcha. And this one from... Ron Nakedness says, tried Googling, quote, entangled photon waveform, unquote. All I got was some weird blog about monad, monadic physics and a, uh, let's see, blank chan post. I'll look up photon quantum computers. There's been some research that has come out of that recently. I don't have any like links on me right now, but this is a cutting edge research that's happening that they have had success in. Using, using entangled photons to start to build quantum computers. So stay tuned because we'll definitely be seeing interesting things coming out of that in the near future. Gotcha. And King024 says, question for Jennifer. Are you familiar with active MRI? I think active MRI has already shown a lot of your ideas are very, very incorrect. Well, you'd have to tell me what exactly MRI, which is electromagnetism interfering with the body, which functions on an electromagnetic basis is somehow a contradiction of my theory. So it's not clear what the contradiction is. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question coming in from bubblegum gun says, LOL, the calculator chat was for Tom. Oh, Tom, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. Pulling it up. What What was the question? This is from, it was like the first one. They said calculators require a mind to exist. Awful argument. So, I think he's saying that you made the assertion that calculators require a mind to exist. Uh, She mentioned that in order to do calculations, you require a mind. I said calculators can do calculations without a mind. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Insect Facet says, Ah, Tom, but how do you know your chair isn't the devil? Checkmate, atheist. I have a divine revelation that gives me the ultimate grounds of supremely important knowledge and without it you just can't ground knowledge it's logically impossible that any other worldview can ground knowledge without the chair gotcha and this one coming in from k 
Captain Ivy, appreciate it, says James, looking dapper. Oh, thank you. Says, billions of neurons. <laughs> I didn't just make that up and edit it, but it sounded like I did. Billions of neurons, not photons, conduct the electrical signals. Jennifer, look up split brain patient studies for emergent consciousness hypotheses. Take a basic intro. Let's see. They say uh, this is like basic intro to psych stuff. And what's been the result of the implementation of this belief system? Oh, right. A bunch of unhealthy people falling apart and who want to die and who don't believe in anything. I think maybe I'll stick with what I know works rather than speculation that I know is just going to run people into the ground. Juicy. S.I.P. says, good job, James. I appreciate that, friend. And I will pass on that good job to our speakers as we do appreciate that they have done a phenomenal job debating tonight. And also, we have a couple more questions. Hang in there. Kathy, let's see. I might have missed one or two. Sorry, folks. The chat was moving fast on me. But Kathy says, for Jennifer, why do you choose the pantheism label over the position of panentheism? And do you find any distinction between the two terms? I think panentheism is the idea that God exists outside of space and time but it's sometimes conflated with the idea of a, an extra universal God. And those two things aren't the same. So I don't want to leave the door open to erroneous misconstructions of my position. So I really do want to just stick with pantheism. It's simple. When you get into stuff like panentheism, the burden of proof shifts away from you because you're positing something that, may not be so easy to prove exists versus the universe who's going to argue with that no one other than the brain in a jar guys and no one really cares what they think anyway juicy and i want to remind you folks whether you're watching on twitch or youtube as we're live on both right now don't forget to hit that subscribe or on twitch that follow button as we are pumped for this wednesday's upcoming debate between dr michael brown and apostate prophet on whether or not there is a god that's going to be a juicy one but Apricot Sloth has a question saying, do viruses, which meet some criteria for life, but not all criteria, have an entangled photon waveform and a consciousness? I think we might have asked this one before. And at this point, it would appear no, like that they don't, but that they are part of the cycle of life and that they are what allow for recombinance of DNA within the animal to happen. I like freshen up your DNA. It's the what it's the mechanism for changing attributes of DNA through sort of sort of like getting stronger through fighting. Gotcha. I, and sorry. Sorry if that's a bad explanation there. Thank you for the question though. This one from Bubblegum Gun says you can't use something made by a mind in order to deny a mind. I think that's for you, Tom. Uh, that's stupid. Like, we can use things made by human minds to deny other things are made by other minds just fine. Gotcha. This one coming in from King 24 just now asks, Jennifer, do you choose to believe your suo, su science? pseudoscience? Is that the abbreviation for pseudo? Is it just S-U-O? It's just mis- it's misspelled. Ah. It's supposed to be P-S-E-U-D-O. Gotcha. Do you believe in your pseudoscience because you believe the current scientific research has led to current societal problems? No, I don't think current scientific research has led to current societal problems. That's a much deeper question that is more largely informed by religion than science. Science has largely helped us to recover a more sane worldview, but there are issues with it. And I would say that... Uh, some of it is obviously quite good. Entropy, uh, a lot of the work done with Fourier transforms, tons of math stuff is awesome. And some of it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So the fact that some of it was right in the first place is the only reason I was able to turn it into something that was 100% right. So definitely don't believe that the current scientific research is the cause of current social problems. It's more of a uh, almost uh, tangential to it thanks for the question gotcha and so folks do want to remind you that our guests are linked in the description we really do appreciate both jennifer and tom it's been a really good time tonight 
And by the way, folks, the fun doesn't end because tomorrow night, as I mentioned, we're going to have a very juicy topic coming up. But I want to say one last thank you to Tom and Jennifer. It's been a true pleasure hosting you tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome to talk to you, Tom and Jay. Thanks for hosting. There's an after show on my channel, Church of Entropy. If anyone wants to check it out, that would be great. Duvid will be there and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully you can come back again. Thanks. 100%. And Jennifer's after show, basically channel. Is it on your channel, Jennifer? The after show? Yes, it is. Okay. We'll be going live in a few minutes. You betcha. So that's linked in the description, folks. And then Amy is also hosting an after show as well. And with that, uh, I'd folks, you can have two tabs open. You can be at both after shows. Huh? So I'll be back in just a moment to let you know about upcoming sweet stuff as we are pumped about the future, folks. Be right back in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, really fun one tonight. I'm so glad. So much support in the channel. So, like so much uh, people in the live chat. Just so much positivity. And I cannot thank our guests enough. Like I said, the debaters are the lifeblood of the channel. We appreciate them. And so huge thanks again to Jennifer and Tom who are linked in the description. And also, folks, oh my gosh, tons of stuff. So we've got about a debate every single day this week. And a lot of you, because it seems it's like... I, I told Jennifer and Tom before we started, I was like, it seems like it's been ages since I streamed as I was setting everything up because the last stream we had was on Friday. And so Saturday, you obviously know that the debate that we are still excited to host and we still, I have no, I have very little doubt that it's going to happen this month. And you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Namely, the debate that you're seeing at the bottom right of your screen, we are pumped to host this bad boy it's going to be epic and want to say thanks everybody for throwing in to the crowdfund to help make this happen. And we also amazingly met our stretch goal. You guys, we are excited about the future. Believe me, things are just going to keep getting bigger and better. And we want to say thank you for making that possible. Like for real, it is a total community effort. Like I'm just a guy sending out emails, like for real, you guys seriously make this a blast just by being here, being a fun chat, being a lively bunch. I do appreciate it so much. You guys have no idea. I am pumped about the future. We have big things in store. And so I want to let you know about some of them right now. But before I let you know about any of the ones that I had not yet mentioned, I'll, I'll let you know, though, that basically one of the speakers was ill on Saturday. Uh, woke up, and uh, I think they had mentioned that they woke up feeling uh, things were bad and uh, basically even went to the emergency room. I don't want to share like too much information, but long story short, um, I have not approached them for like a new date because I don't, not yet, but I plan on in the next day or two, I will. The reason though, is I'm like, I just want them to get better and to be able to rest and not feel like I'm bugging them about a new date for the debate. So I do, like I said, think that it's going to happen this month, theoretically, uh, within the next two weeks, maybe, I don't know, but I'll keep you updated on that. And so thank you so much though. Our understanding is, you know, sometimes life happens and we just hope that the debaters are okay. And in this case, that's like why I said we just told the debater, we're like, absolutely, let's just reschedule. Like, we want you to get plenty of rest. So we are exciting about or excited about other exciting debates. Let me tell you about those in just a moment. But first, I want to say hi to you in the, the old chat. Get to say hello. It's fun. Media Hits, thanks for coming by, as well as D Weezy. Glad you're here. Hannah Anderson, thanks for all you do as a moderator and all of your support. Perfect one. Thanks for dropping in. Bubblegum Gun says, amazing. And you are right about that. Henry Hansen, glad you made it. As well as in Hacks, good to see you. And Dave Gar, pumped. Thanks for dropping in. King 101, we are glad you're here. As well as Lily Aja, thanks for all of your support. Seriously, all of your moderating and everything else. And then the old Twitch chat, pardon my delay, but Ozzy and thanks for gifting subs tonight. That really is encouraging. And I am pumped, you guys, as Believe me, we are excited that the Twitch is growing. And so, yeah, like I said, hit that follow button if you're 
partying in the old Twitch chat right now as we're exciting that we are growing there. And also, if you're watching on Twitch and maybe you're like, you know, I like Twitch, but I like YouTube better. Well, want to let you know we are streaming on YouTube at the same time. So I'll throw the YouTube link into the old Twitch chat as you might be wondering, like, yeah, I was like, how do I get over there to the uh, YouTube stream of this debate? I just put it in the Twitch chat. But Nyphen, thanks for coming by. Am I saying it right? As well as Amy Newman, good to see you. And Second Horizon and EndOXD, thanks for dropping in. As well as H Jasper E, good to see you again. Nat Man Prime, thanks for coming by. As well as Apophis Rex, thanks for dropping in. Jeremy Love, glad to have you here. And Church of Entropy, Jennifer, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the old chat. Third finger from the right, thanks for coming by. Says your epidermis is showing. Of course, I know that Simpsons reference. I am a huge Simpsons fan. Nobody's a bigger Simpsons fan than me. So yeah, we could we should do some Simpsons quotes. But General Balzac, good to see you. Says those lights reflecting on modern database glasses are wild. Did you notice, folks? New lighting, and I'm still perfecting the lighting. This I'm far from knowing anything about lighting in terms of like a good quality picture and all that good stuff. So we are using for the first night the ring light. And let me show you. If you've never seen this type of light before, really cool, you guys. So huge thank you to David uh, as a, a gift to the channel had sent this. And so we are excited to improve, you could say, our tech. And I'm fixing this right now to where there now it maybe is better. You guys can let me know if you're like, James, no, 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 it's not better. I'm like learning how these work. Does that look a little better? Let me know. New to this. I'm a work in progress, folks. But Stripper Liquor, good to see you, and said, yes, that's right. I am going to pin Jennifer's uh, after show as well. And there's always, or not always, but oftentimes more than one after show. Like I said, you can have more than one tab open. You can be at both parties at the same time. So the internet makes some things possible that you just couldn't do in real life. And then Human Girl, good to see you. Let something shine. Come. Uh, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming by. And then Riley S., good to see you. Thanks for all of your work you do as a mod. want to say a huge thank you to the moderators. Brooke Chavis, Heat Shield, Sideshow Nav, Chris Gammon, uh, Hannah Anderson. Like There are so many moderators that do a fantastic job. And we are so thankful to have that many moderators. And so we really do appreciate that. And then Jeremy Love says, James, do you have to send in money for a question? No, actually, tonight we actually read several questions that were just standard questions in the chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, that is the way to get your question in the list. Now, like once in a while, I miss them, but I try to get them. Um, oftentimes, though, I got to be honest, just to give you a heads up, we do prioritize the super chats. And sometimes if the, if the debate goes long... I do want to respect the time of the debaters. So like sometimes I will, we, we don't always get to standard questions. In other words, sometimes we just read the super chats and sometimes we don't even read all the super chats. Um, and in that case, like I said, folks, if you've ever had your super chat missed, you can always email me at moderndaydebate at gmail.com. I can Venmo or PayPal the money back because we really do. We know that you you want it to be read on air and the, like that's that makes sense. So that's why it's like, well, hey, like if you do email me and let me know if I missed it, then I want to send it back because I don't want to leave you out to dry like that. But we do. Yeah. The reason though is like, we're thankful for our guests. And so long story short, we always want to make sure that we get them out of here at a decent time. Cause sometimes it's amazing. We'll have like these, like a three hour debate and like an hour and a half almost, or maybe an hour is like questions. And so I'm like, I got to let them out of here sometime. But anyway, Amanda, thanks for all that you do as a moderator as well. And also, Steve Cote, good to see you. As Rathaza, Rathaza, Rathaya. Let me try that again. As Rathaza, Rathazala. Thank you for coming by. We are glad that you're with us. And so, want to let you know now, folks. Yeah, and OXD said, I hope Matt and Kenny are okay. You think that the debate will happen? I definitely think it'll happen. And uh, so... We do really appreciate Matt and Kenny and being uh, like, I, I don't have any doubts about their, them wanting to do the debate. I think it's going to be a great discussion. It's technically, I got to be, I got to level with you. It's, it's a debate, but more so like, cause there are still openings, you know, like that makes it a little bit less 
more toward the debate than discussion, but there is substantial discussion where it's like arguably more discussion than debate. And so I'm pumped for it, though, not to try to be pedantic and correct you. <laughs> I mean, the only reason I'm saying that is just because I think it's going to be a really friendly, easygoing dialogue, which is really cool because we want the speakers like tonight was a friendly, easygoing dialogue. There's a little bit of teasing and stuff, but, you know, it's like not bad. And then Ferenc Alice says, thanks, James, and the debaters. Thank you, Ferran, for all of your support. We're glad you're here. And then. I'm catching up with chat. Two seconds. I'm almost there, folks. It's moving fast. Thank you, Brooke, for saying thank you. I mean, it's my pleasure. It's always fun for me just to be here. And so YouTube Surgeon General says, what show was The Simpsons first on before its first season aired? Wow, that's a good question. I honestly, let's see, what show was The, the Simpsons first on? before its first season aired? I actually don't know that. I'll admit that. That's a pretty juicy question. I can't wait to hear the answer. Brooke Chavez says, smash that like button. Now, that's true. Folks, if you enjoyed this debate, if you're like, yeah, it's all right, you know, go ahead and hit that like button as we do appreciate it. That encourages me. It makes me more motivated. When I see that people are like engaged and they're enjoying the channel, that motivates me more to put more debates on and also higher quality debates. So feel free to hit that good old like button. And Lewis Guile says it's bright. It is a bright light. You're right about that. And we're still perfecting it. I'm going to try to build a, uh, what are those called? Like the box lights, you know? Like I'm going to try to build one, no joke. And I'm going to try to build it out of my like little like desk lamp. It's going to be cool. I'll show you guys. It's like a fun little craft project. Wonder Crab, good to see you. Thanks for your kind words. It says, thank you, James. Thank you. I appreciate that, my friend. That means a lot. And Heat Shield says, when you moved around to show the ring light, your audio fell way off. If you ever have to move around, just know that your current mic will lose you. That's good to know. And then Captain IV says, hope you're doing better, James. Keep up the great work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Man, I was pretty exhausted last week. And I'm surprised that I feel like pretty energized right now. It's weird because before I got, before I started, to be honest, like a half hour before the debate, I was like shot. It must be dinner. I had dinner right before. But... Pancake of Destiny says, you lost the face expression battle with T-Jump tonight. How do you feel? <laughs> That's right. Tom has a lot of different expressions. And the one and only Rao says, definitely not glad I'm with him. James, I will be sending a heated letter to Pasta Mike. I don't know who you're talking about. Definitely not glad you're not with who? I don't know. But um, let's see. Uh, let's... Uh... Let's farm. Good to see you. Mr. P, are you here? I hope you're doing well, buddy. Uh, and then Raw Nakedness says, I like smacking the dislike button. As long as you smack it twice in a row. And then YouTube Surgeon General says, the Tracy Allman show on HBO. Actually, you know what, folks? You may have noticed. I mean, if you're looking at the dislikes, you're like, well, we got five dislikes. Oh, that's brutal. It's because we have five viewers from Australia. Okay? That's why. Now, also, uh, so street cred to Timio. I think it was Timio for that joke. But Ron Nakedness says, Bart's voice actor is a Mormon. I had no idea. Are you serious? And Amanda says, favorite Simpsons character? Oh, that's a good question. Man, probably, I mean, it's probably Homer. Homer is like the, I, I get a kick out of stupid, selfish characters. Uh, like Michael Scott and Homer have a lot in common if you think about it. Jeremy Love says, James, you're awesome. Thanks for all the debates. Thank you, Jeremy Love, for your kind words. Seriously, that means a lot. And this is fun. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, it is a blast, and, and we appreciate the guests. It's hard to emphasize that enough. And then Surgeon General says, the Tracy Ullman show on HBO. You serious? I didn't know that. That's pretty interesting. Bruce Wayne says, I couldn't hit or smash the button, but I did click it. Thank you for clicking it. I hope you clicked it good and hard. And Wesley Curry says, Wesley Curry the second, is that how it said? We're glad you came by. As well as, Urshman, good to see you. Says, LOL, much love from Australia. <laughs> Thanks for your support with those likes. And then, let's see, AP, thanks for dropping in, as well as Thomas MacArthur. We're glad to have you here. That's funny. He says, put the light behind your head. You will be a St. James. That's so funny. I wonder if it'll actually look like that. I can't help but be curious. I mean, 
my petty curiosity. Oh, it's like, I don't know. It looks, to me, it looks like blurry. I wanted to see if it would actually like look, you know, but anyway. I'm reading the comments and I always love it. I always like to get to uh, just see what you guys are saying. But let me know if you have thoughts, if you have things that you want to say and you're like, hey, let me know. Oh, the one and only Rao says, dude, you totally misrepresented me. I was totally saying that I'm the lame one, not you. Are you talking to me? I don't know if you're talking to me or somebody else. But believe me, if you're hanging out here, you're not lame. And I've got to tell you, believe me, folks, we, Brian Griffin says, do you like Family Guy? I've liked some Family Guy stuff, I'm, but I'm, it's like The Simpsons and The Office are by far my favorite shows of all time. And then, let's see here. I think King 101 is right. He says, something tells me the number of dislikes come from non-audiences or trolls. I think that, yeah, probably non-audiences, namely, we do have some haters, folks. Believe me, like there really are. And they're a small percent. So like, don't feel discouraged. Like when I bring up that we have haters, I'm not saying it as a means of like being like, oh, this is bad. I, in a way, I mean, folks, we're doing something big here. We're doing something epic here. We are providing a platform, a neutral one, fully neutral. So there are no videos. It's not like later tonight, you're going to see a video come out at 11 o'clock or that's like five minutes for most of you because you're in the East Coast, but you're not going to see a video come out where it's like, hey, here's why so-and-so in tonight's debate was really correct and the other person was wrong. You'll never see that. And you'll never see you know, any of that. It's pure debates here, baby. You can let your mind rest easily with the fact that modern-day debate only has maybe one or two like kind of ideas that were like, hey, we'll openly push this. One, debate is valuable. People can learn a lot through debate because you have the two speakers trying to bring their trying to bring their best arguments forth. And so there's kind of like an efficiency to it in terms of your learning because they're going to bring their what they think is their best at least. Nobody's perfect at recognizing that, but nonetheless. The other thing is we want to give everybody a fair shot. Like we do believe in that. And so that's why we're like when I see some people who are like why do you platform so and so? I'm going to go cry in my cornflakes and I'm like Wow, very sad. The reason I think it's sad is it's like, hey, we'll give everybody a shot. And I know it's controversial. But when we bring on somebody like, when they're giving a view that some would consider out of this world, like sometimes we get flack for hosting flat earthers. I would say, hey, if we are going to really walk the walk in terms of being tolerant, we're going to have to do that. We're going to give everybody a fair shot. And my thing is, I'm like, hey, I'm willing to take the heat. And the funny thing is, believe me, folks, when I see the haters, all of the losers and haters, when I see, because once in a while on Twitter, blah, 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 people are like, oh, modern day debate, I get more motivated and I get excited because for me, I'm like, hey, if we were doing something that was kind of like lame or non-special, you could say, nobody would really care, right? But it's natural. I mean, when we're doing something big, when we have a broad, gigantic vision, namely to provide a level playing field for everybody to make their case on that neutral platform, hey, people are going to get upset. But we're excited about it. It's a big vision. And so we're going to fill it. We're going to carry it out. And it's going to be epic. Insect Facet says, you've had debates on lots of weird stuff. Bigfoot, that's another one. How about Gnosticism, or at least its successor, the Cathar, the Cathar religion? Maybe, I don't know. The one thing is, I'm like, I don't know if people would know what it's about. I'm not sure. Um, the truth is, there is, a, there is a truth to the idea that... Um, so yeah, I don't know. Long story. If, you, if you're serious about it, you can email me, and it lets you know... There's usually an automatic sent email that it'll send to everybody that just lets people know like what the typical conditions are for what we look for in a debater as we are becoming a little bit more, you could say stringent, a little bit more strict in terms of what we want. One is we always kind of getting more strict. We, we've grandfathered some people in like Nephilim Free, never has to use a camera. Uh, but nonetheless, and there are a couple of others that we don't require to, you know, if Team Skeptic doesn't want to use a camera, I'm okay with that because Team and, and Nephilim Free have helped us a lot. 
when we were small channels, like they were willing to come on and, and that helped us a lot and we're thankful. But for new people, it is, yeah, it's a little bit tougher now. We're saying, like, hey, you know, we need you to use a camera, that kind of thing. But Thomas MacArthur says, have you done a debate on the Loch Ness Monster? No, we haven't. I would actually be open to it. And frankly, I'd actually, like, enjoy it. I like juicy topics like that. Bellis Breckenridge says, smash that like. I agree. Smash it. Smash it good and hard. And then I got to run in just a little bit. Because, oh, man, this week's been really busy. I don't know if I told you. I'm still moving. So it's been like with work, I, like I've got to do comprehensive exam prep. So I've got this exam coming up at the end of the year. It's going to be gigantic. And I've got to prep for it like pretty much almost every day I, I try to. It's gigantic. And the idea is that as well as trying to get research stuff in and then, you know, modern day debate. I have like so little time to where at the end of the day, I like do a little bit of like my moving and stuff and like taking stuff out of the box. And then usually in the morning, I try to do a little bit, but oh man, it's been really busy. I haven't gotten to play Zelda Ocarina of Time for like a week. That's how busy it is, you guys. Sunday Warship, good to see you. And then Steve Coat, thanks for coming by. He says, measure in success in haters. It's true. I get, I get a lot of jollies from the haters. So I am honestly... I appreciate your guys' kind words. When I bring up the haters, I appreciate that you guys are super supportive. And I, I hope you don't think that I'm like trying to make it sound as if like I'm a victim. I'm thinking like if we got haters, we're doing something big. It's going, it's inevitable that it's going to happen, that we're, we're going to have some haters. And so I hope you know that I'm, I'm not trying to complain or make myself out to be a victim. You guys are super like supportive. And frankly, like 99% of people are actually very supportive of the channel. Whenever I tell people in real life, like about modern day debate, they're like, Hey, that's a cool idea, man. Like that's, that's great. You're doing that. So I'm like super encouraged, but insect fest says, well, I'm an atheist anyway, so I couldn't do it justice. I just think Gnostic versus Christian might be a lot of fun. That could be, I'm open to it. I like that. It's new. That's for sure. And then And Hack says, good luck with your exam, James. I'm sure you'll ace it and get back to the important things like Zelda. <laughs> That's funny. I appreciate that. How long? Good to see you. As well as Brian Stevens says, you need to play some Zelda Breath of the Wild. It is life-changing. Oh, you know what? Guess who else was saying they were playing Zelda Breath of the Wild? Last time, I think it was the last time we were streaming even. Uh, I think it was Raw Nakedness. But yeah, I'm a huge Zelda fan. And then Riley S says, Ocarina of Time, I didn't know this about you, James. Oh, yeah, I'm a huge Ocarina of Time person. Like, I could probably play that game over and over. I, I liked Majora's Mask, too. And Steve Coe thinks your kind words. It's funny. And then... <sighs> Sorry, guys. I got to go in a minute. But Razor of says, fun debate, James. Would you would love a pro wrestling versus MMA debate. Would be cool if debaters could do a promo video, WWF style, before each debate. Keep up the good work. That would be cool. And then Riley S. says, I was a Nintendo kid, LOL. I'm deaf. You mean like the classic Nintendo? And then... Thanks, Silver Harlow, for dropping in. Good to see you again. Mike Duran says, do you require the debaters to have a YouTube channel? No, we don't. Uh, there are other ways of, like, if you email, like, there's ways we can try to work it out. There's, like, different, like, ways that we try to make something work and then nicholas petrus good to see you and human girl and raw nakedness i'm convinced are the same person is anybody else convinced of this or am i the only person that's thought this this whole time you guys let me know because i'm like maybe i'm just totally wrong in terms of like this but insect facet says castlevania symphony of the night man castlevania trust me i played let me is castlevania i'm trying to remember which one that was because i did play the first castlevania uh on nintendo 64 i know that there are older ones that came out before that so i'm trying to remember symphony of the night okay so that was on playstation and it looks cool i don't deny that Castlevania was a fun game. Like I did get really into Castlevania and I actually did beat, um, I think it was with, I'm trying to remember which character I was, but anyway, I do like Castlevania. And then 
Brian Griffin says, can't lie. I'm a beta. That's right. I, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not agreeing that you're a beta. I just like that you brought up the word beta so we could say Jesse Lee Peterson terms or uh, phrases. And then Pancake of Destiny says, Ocarina of Time, best game ever. I think you're right. It honestly is so fun. Riley S. says, no, just Nintendo games in general. I got to replay the old Zeldas and I never played the newer ones for some reason. That's funny. I didn't know that, Riley S. And um, I'm thinking about this. This is super interesting. And then... Oh, that's right. The moon in Majora's Mask was scary. Brian Stevens says, write A down, write A down. Let me try to remember. Is that a tune from, I'm trying to remember what write, write A down. Because I know I play that all, like, yeah, okay, write A down. So that's definitely a song on the ocarina. I'm trying to remember what it was. Because I know I play that song a lot. And it's one of the few I've got memorized. Is it the song of time? Or no, maybe it's the song of... The Sun Song. Anyway. It's, it's the one that I think you use to move the big blue boxes. And so, yeah. I am pumped, though. Okay, Song of Time. Thanks, Brian. But anyway, I've got to go, folks. Sorry, it's a, it's a really busy week. Otherwise, I'd honestly love to stay longer. Um, it's like, if I can get through this week of like all this moving stuff, it's, I, did I tell you, I'm not trying to brag, but I am really proud of myself. I didn't, I was kind of like, at first, I was like, I don't know if, like, if I could do that. I purchased a used uh, washer and dryer, and I have so far installed the washer, and it works great, which is exciting. Uh, it's like a really old, it's pretty old, but Hey, that's how I like it. I'm very frugal. If any of you knew in my real life, like if, if you ask Tom, you know, when Tom and I used to travel, uh, for debates and stuff, like, I'm like, you know, Tom maybe wants to go to like, Oh, I want to go to Panera. And I'm like, no, no, no. McDonald's for the $1 McChicken. That's where we're going, Tom. So I am very frugal. <laughs> I don't know if Tom really likes Panera. I can't remember. I remember, did you guys ever see on Instagram, there's a picture of me and Tom um, at Chick-fil-A when I took Tom to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah. And I got, I got to go in a minute. But anyway, it's, it's so hard to leave. I just enjoy this, you guys. You guys, it's it's fun. He Jill says, I'm wondering what a useful Bitcoin debate would cover. I mean, it exists and it and is being used there's no debate about that is the question should it exist yeah heat shield so this is what i would like to get don't get your hopes up because the odds of us getting him are like slim to none but you never know i would hope to get i'm going to reach out to um i'm going to try to reach out to warren buffett because warren buffett actually i don't fully understand it uh, i've only listened to a couple clips Warren Buffett thinks that Bitcoin is going to, at some point in time, he thinks it's not going to end well. He And he means that with all, uh, what's the term, e-currencies e or digital currencies. For some reason, Warren Buffett, surprisingly, is kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. He's pretty reluctant about it. So whether or not it's going to, like, whether you could say maybe a debate on whether or not the future of Bitcoin is optimistic or bright, that would be a fun one. Whether or not I could actually get Warren Buffett, don't get your hopes up. But that's, I, I'm, you never know. It's uh, always worth asking. Razawad, of course, says James as a Tekken character would be dope. That sounds pretty dank. And then, let's see, Kathy says, did you know that in Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time, you, if you let a butterfly land on the Deku stick, it'll turn into a fairy? Oh, that sounds familiar. I think someone told me that like 100 years ago, and I completely forgot I have to try that because I see butterflies in the game. And I remembered thinking when I saw butterflies, I was like, I can't remember why, but I think those are like, usually I was thinking, I was like, I think they mark a fairy fountain, but I couldn't find the fairy fountain. And so what you're saying makes sense. So I'm going to have to try that. That would be cool. Capture it in a bottle. And then night, Brian Stevens. Thanks for coming by. I promise I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm also saying goodbye in a moment <laughs> this is like, you guys it's so hard not to chat it's just fun 
I enjoy this. It says stripper liquor says James uses his old tidy whities as handkerchiefs. So frugal. Now that would be fun. But yeah. Oh yeah, man. You guys are so funny. I just I'm loving. I I love it. Uh, reading your guys' chats. <laughs> Hannah says frugal equals cheap in this case. LOL. That's so funny. But yeah. Um, you guys, Bryce uses ten dollars to get you ten big chickens. I mean, that's a good deal. It is a good deal. I also love. I'm a big on uh, Chipotle. It's more expensive, but I mean, I can get it to fill me for like the whole day almost. And but yeah, so I I should go. I love you guys. Thank you for all of your support. I'm excited about the future of this channel. Seriously, we are just getting started. So thank you for everything, Lord or uh, everybody. And so. Liliadra says, take care, everyone. Thanks to those who kept, or well, thank, like, I gotta be, I gotta be real. Because you guys, uh, maybe you don't know. And I don't, so that was, I think that would have been a Freudian slip right there. Uh, I do thank the Lord as well. So I, you know, you guys know that I'm, maybe you don't know I'm a theist and a Christian in particular. But I, um, so I didn't want to say, so I, I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful to the Lord. I'm, um, thankful for you guys being my friends and, and just in my life. You guys, honestly, you guys make it fun. You guys are enjoyable people. And so I do appreciate you guys. I appreciate your common love for Ocarina of Time and your common love for McChickens and all these things. But, uh, but yeah, that's interesting. So Freudian slips, though. We should talk a little bit about Freud because there's some pretty interesting stuff about Freud. So uh, that was like an interesting... So if you ever like look at Freudian slips on the news and like sometimes it's like there's like a really like, I don't know, I get a kick out of Freud. I'll be honest. I think there's more to Freud than people give credit for. Uh, there's a couple things in particular. Everybody believes. OK, we should talk about Freud another night. There is some really interesting stuff, though. Thanks to your kind words, Brian, Stephen. Seriously, that means a lot. Thanks, Steve Coat and Human Girl and Riley S. Thanks for your kind words. So thank you, guys. I hope you have a great night. We will talk about Freud. Ask me about Freud sometime. I think there's some legit stuff about... I think there is some spooky stuff in the brain. Uh, I've thought about some interesting stuff in terms of, like, dreams. I don't think they're random. I'll tell you that. I don't think that they're necessarily... And frankly, I think they're... Like, I, I'm not saying that I think they're, like, I'm not trying to argue that they're premonitions or something, but I also, the idea that, which is a common and it's a popular idea among psychologists, and it's probably the most popular, I don't buy it that dreams are, they're certainly not fully random. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. Let me just stay around for a few minutes to talk about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, well, here's a couple of things to think about. You think dreams are random. Well, I mean, they're certainly not completely random, right? Because completely random would maybe be like words that maybe don't even have a meaning or words that are like completely scrambled such that they don't even make coherent sentences. Like to me, that's fully random. So the fact that there are like words with meanings or even like stories in dreams, like that is like, well, it's like, what are the odds that that's just randomly generated? There's something to it. I would probably concede there's like elements of dreams have randomness. I don't deny that, but certain parts uh, for sure, I, I'm like, I'm like, I highly doubt that's random. And here's another thing to consider. If dreams are random, there is something really spooky about recurring dreams. If they're random, you'd think that it would just be like, you know, just random dreams, like a recurring dream, whatever the content of that dream is, like maybe it's somebody, you know, chasing you or whatever it is it would have an equal shot according to random chance of being your dream on a given night. And yet there are a lot of dreams like recurring dreams that people will have many, many times where it's like, well, geez, that's weird that it would just randomly, you'd keep having that. I think there's something to dreams. I, I wouldn't go as far as Freud, but I do think there's like, there's gotta be, there's some truth to it. I think some of that stuff. So um, that's one thing to think about. There are other reasons though. I mean, <clears throat> we'll talk about that uh, next time more. But Reswad, of course, says sell modern day debate underwear. Call them why? Call them why? Why fronts? I don't know what that means. And then 
And Hacks says, is Chewbacca, if Chewbacca's a Wookiee, he must acquit. I know that's from South Park. I, I, I can't, it's been like too long for me to know the context. Riley S. says, James is a Bible boy. And YouTube Surgeon General says, thank you. And uh, we enjoy you as well. Thank you, YouTube Surgeon General. And let's see. Um, and Riley S. says, lovingly, I say that. I, I appreciate that. I know that you didn't mean any, any malicious thing by it. And then um, let's see. Raw Nakedness says, sell modern day debate bath water. Next time I take a bath, I will totally bottle it. Uh, bottle it. Um, and you guys will like, uh, <laughs> who would want who would want that? Uh, and then <clears throat> Brian Stevens says, dreams equal 4D reality. That's juicy. We should, yeah, there's so many, there's interesting things about dreams. There's other like phenomena that are interesting that, well, here, like there's some like interesting stuff in terms of your, I, I'd have to go back to it. There's like a lecture I've taught on dreams that it was like, now that's pretty interesting. I'm not like as far as, uh, I, yeah, anyway. So anyway, I, I like getting to read about, or uh, I'm reading your guys' stuff. Human Girl says, I love learning about dreams. And then, uh, let's see, Insect Facet says, aren't dreams just far out extrapolations of your daily experience induced by your brain when it's running on low power? That's another theory of dreams. So here's what's interesting is it's like, well, um, far out extrapolations of your daily experience. It's like, well, I mean, m maybe, I mean, that's the, so one of the theories of dreams too, is that like, well, maybe dreams are like stuff from your day. Um, and it's like, well, but I don't know. Think about all the weird dreams that we have where it's like an alien invasion or some sort of demonic possession or, you know, whatever kind of spooky dreams people have. And it might be good dreams too. It doesn't have to be bad. But so for me, I'm like, well, um, it's like, to say it's a, so it's like, it's certainly not uh, insect, insect facet. I'm not trying to straw man you. So I'm going to address what you're saying. But when people say like, isn't it, it, aren't dreams, it's just your brain is like organizing the information from your day. It's trying to like process it and make sense of it. It's like, well, some of it that is, seems plausible, but some of it is like, you're dreaming of things that are just like absolutely insane. And you know, you're like maybe like flying around and you know, you've got alien invasions and all that things. And it's like, well, geez, that's hard to think of like, how you didn't experience that in your day and even anything close to it. And now maybe you're like, people are like, well, maybe it's symbolic. Cause maybe it's like a, you flew on a plane that day. And like, that's the closest you could get to it. But I highly doubt that all people's flying dreams are when they're, you know, flew on a plane that day. But Riley S says dreams are actually the real world. Stripper liquor says dreams are your brain taking a shower while you sleep. Yeah. There's certainly truth. To the idea of like your brain is cleaning stuff out while you're asleep so yeah it's so important to get sleep that the research we could talk about all the benefits now it's fascinating i don't know what percent would you guys guess what percent of dreams would you guess are negative because the research has been done on this i'm kind of curious what what you'd say and i'm going to read the chat in the meantime and then i'll let you guys know the answer steve coat says check out seizures if you're curious about causality and dreams that sounds interesting and then riley s says dream cheated in his minecraft speed run that's funny. I don't know who your friend Dream is, but <laughs> I hope he gets what he deserves. And then Hannah Anderson says, Freud was a wacko. Jeremy loves his James. Thank you. Get some rest. Thank you. I promise I will in a second. Reservoir of Gore says, James has a nightmare in which he's hosting a debate naked, or is it a fantasy? Reservoir of Gore, only you. And then Kathy, that's true. Lucid dreams you can control, which is interesting. Um, Manic Panda says, have you ever had lucid dreams? They're fun and different. I have uh, to a small degree. Pancake of Destiny says, have you ever tried a lucid dreaming? Wow, you guys all thought of it at the exact same time. There must have been a trigger that uh, was interesting. But Michael Kaufman says, I have reoccurring dreams. And then, yeah, d debate on dreams actually would be pretty interesting. I, I, that's something that I might get a kick out of jumping into because it's not very controversial. I feel like I could get away with that. Um, Silver Harlow says, your brain tries to organize input into thoughts using memories, like a picture of your room makes thoughts of your room when asleep. The inputs are random, but the memories, that's pretty interesting, Silver. And then Justin Matthews says, yes, lucid is conscious, but your manifestation is dictated by your subconscious. So is your daily life. That's pretty fascinating. And then, and Hax says, sorry, that was a bit random. I didn't even see, what was it? Did you tag me in the first one in Hax? And then, King 101 says, you should do alien slash UFOs considering the recent controversy. I'm open to that. And then, and Hex says, I don't remember having any replicated dreams since I was eight or nine. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had as many either. Um, now, let me see if you guys have guessed what percent. So here's what's crazy. 
a whopping 80% of your dreams are negative. Like by negative, I mean like they have a negative emotional valence such that, for example, like it's an experience in the dream that you find unpleasant, uh, um, you're, you, such that you have negative affect. Uh, maybe you're being chased by something. Maybe you failed an exam. You show up to work late, whatever it is. A huge percent are negative, which is crazy. It's 75 to 80 percent. So pretty crazy. And uh, I can get, if you guys ever want the source, I've got the textbook that I use to from that. Um, I can look it up if you want to like learn more. But also, what's interesting on kind of like almost the opposite um, side of that is that guess what percent of dreams are sexual? All you perverts. Insect facets. I don't think it's your brain organizing info necessarily, just amplifying noise that your conscious mind normally keeps down. That's interesting. And then Brooke says, I have crazy dreams. I believe it. <laughs> like, not because it's you, Brooke, but because it's just, I, I sometimes still have crazy dreams. I haven't remembered a dream for like, I'm trying to remember the last one I can remember. Like lately, I just haven't really remembered my dreams. The trick is you got to rehearse it right away when you wake up. That helps a lot. And Brian Katarin says, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming by, Brian. We're glad you're here. And then, oh, hold on a second. I've got to refresh my Zoom. Oh, you guys, you guys couldn't see me. My Zoom had timed out apparently sometime in the past. And then, so amazingly, you all of you perverts, um, yeah, according to Freud, 100%. Yeah, Freud would probably overshoot it big time because he was always talking about these repressed sexual urges you'd have for somebody or whatever, uh, like maybe somebody you're not supposed to have. But it's actually, like, I, I'm serious because you're going to find it hard to believe me. It's actually 20% of your dreams are sexual. That's the typical. Now, some of you out there, I don't know, maybe you're an outlier because, I mean, Stripper Liquor says 100%. Michael Kaufman says 90%. Now we know a lot more about you guys. Steve Coates is 110%. <laughs> William Light says 100%. You guys are seriously funny. But yeah. Um, and then Silver Harlow says, one of your brain's jobs is to make your inputs into a coherent story. Now that's pretty interesting. We should definitely talk more about that as well. And then, um, but yeah, I want to say thank you guys so much for all of your support, all of your love, and... I hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. We'll be back tomorrow night. It's going to be awesome, you guys. Seriously, I'm, I'm excited for it. And so thanks all for your support and your love. I, I enjoy you guys. I hope you have a great night.